In our journey of faith, it's easy to imagine spiritual attacks as dramatic, almost cinematic events. But friends, the reality is often far more subtle and insidious. Unlike the grandiose depictions we see in the media, spiritual warfare doesn't always come with a booming voice or a visible demon. It's crucial to understand that the enemy, the devil, operates primarily through deception, preferring to stay unnoticed, whispering lies and doubts into our lives. Consider the sneaky ways these attacks manifest. They often resemble ordinary life changes, but with a twist. It's like walking through a fog, not realizing it's slowly leading you off your path. You might start facing a series of unfortunate events, one after the other. Suddenly, you're dealing with a cascade of problems, losing your job, experiencing family tragedies, or unexpected accidents. It feels like you're caught in an unending storm. And with each thunderclap, your focus drifts further away from where it should be, on Jesus. But here's where the true battle lies, in your response. These relentless waves of trouble aim to distract you, to flood your heart with despair and doubt. The devil's intention? To shift your gaze from the solution, which is always Jesus. Remember, when you're focused on the storms around you, you can easily start sinking into fear and hopelessness. Let's draw inspiration from the story of Peter walking on water. Amidst a storm, Peter sees Jesus and steps out in faith. Initially, he's doing great, but the moment he takes his eyes off Jesus, the waves overpower him and he begins to sink. This moment teaches us a vital lesson. When the waves of spiritual attacks rise, when you feel like you're drowning in the troubles of this world, the key is to keep your eyes firmly on Jesus. It's that unwavering focus on Him that will keep you afloat. So, dear friends, if you find yourself overwhelmed by life's sudden downpours, remember Peter and the sea. Keep your eyes on Jesus. In Him, you'll find the strength to stand firm against these hidden currents. 2. The Resurgence of Old Habits, a Spiritual Red Flag In the midst of our spiritual journey, there's a subtle yet profound sign that often goes unnoticed. The Resurgence of Old Habits Imagine you're on a path to transformation, embracing a new way of life in Christ. You've taken the plunge, been baptized, and committed to a life of righteousness. It's like emerging from a chrysalis where the old self gives way to the new godly existence. But here's the catch. Transformation is a journey, not a destination. The adversary, in his cunning ways, isn't about to release his grip so easily. Think of it as a game of spiritual tug of war. You're pulling towards a life of godliness, and there on the other side is the devil, pulling you back into past lifestyles and habits. It's a battle of wills, where old friends might reappear, cloaked in the guise of good intentions, yet subtly nudging you towards past mistakes. These are not mere coincidences. They are calculated moves in a spiritual chess game aimed at derailing your progress. Consider the allegory of the sower in Matthew 13, where Jesus talks about seeds falling among thorns. These seeds sprout, but the thorns, the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth, choke them, preventing fruitful growth. This is akin to our spiritual journey. We receive the word with joy, but the entanglements of past habits, the thorny vines of old vices, can suffocate our spiritual growth. This is why it's crucial to be alert to the company we keep. Surround yourself with individuals who propel you forward, not those who drag you back into the shadows of your past. It's about choosing progress over regress, light over darkness. Beware of isolation, too, as it's a tactic from the enemy's playbook. Remember, in unity lies strength. The Bible tells us in Matthew 18, 20, For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. We're not meant to navigate life's journey solo. We thrive in the fellowship of believers in the collective strength of a community rooted in faith. 3. The Heavy Cloak of Discouragement 
In this journey we call life, especially as chosen ones of God, there comes a time when a heavy cloak seems to drape over our shoulders. This isn't just any cloak. It's woven with threads of discouragement and dyed in the deep blues of depression. Friends, this is more than a mere down day. It's a clear sign of a spiritual attack targeting your heart and spirit. Picture this. Your joy, once bright as the morning sun, starts to dim. Your hope, which used to be as solid as a rock, begins to crumble like sand. It's as if the very faith that has been your guiding light seems to flicker in a relentless wind. You feel overwhelmed, like carrying a mountain on your back, and everything around seems gray and void of color. But here's the turning point in our story. We are not defenseless. Inside each of us burns the unquenchable fire of the Holy Spirit. This divine presence is a fortress against these invisible onslaughts. The enemy, with all its cunning schemes, aims to extinguish our inner light. But what it forgets is that our light is fueled by an eternal source. The battlefield is not our flesh and blood. It's an unseen arena where spiritual forces clash. As warriors of faith, our armor is not forged by human hands. It's given by God Himself. This armor shields us, not just in battles we see, but also in those we don't. When we feel this weight of discouragement, it's a call to arms. It's time to kneel in prayer, asking God to replenish our strength, to wrap us in peace that's beyond any earthly understanding, and to rekindle the joy and hope within us. Remember, His peace is like a river. It flows. It refreshes. It brings life wherever it goes. And let's not forget the power of fellowship. Reach out to your brothers and sisters in Christ. Their prayers, their words of encouragement, are like balm to a weary soul. Together, we form an unbreakable chain of faith, lifting each other up when one of us falters. In moments when things seem bleak, when peace feels like a distant dream, the stress clings to you like a second skin. Know that these are not mere coincidences. It's a spiritual tug of war for your heart. The urge to give up, the struggle in your prayer life, the feeling of disconnection from your community, the draining of your energy, the loss of motivation, these are all alarm bells signaling that the enemy is attempting to sway you from your divine path. But here's the secret weapon. The enemy's attacks are a testament to your importance in God's grand design. You are being targeted because you are a threat to the darkness with your light. So, when you feel this heavy cloak of discouragement, remember, it's not a sign of defeat, but a call to rise, a reminder of your worth in this spiritual warfare. 4. The Battle in Stillness When Prayer Feels Like Climbing Mountains In the trenches of our spiritual journey, there's a subtle yet profound indicator of a spiritual onslaught, the sudden weightiness of prayer. It's as if, out of nowhere, our prayers feel like climbing steep, insurmountable mountains, each word a laborious step, each plea a breathless gasp. This isn't about those ordinary days when our spiritual rhythm feels off. No, this is different. It's like trying to speak through a heavy fog, where even the simplest prayer feels like a battle cry. Let's get real here. It's easy to slide into a routine where talking to God becomes a task we keep pushing off our to-do list. But this isn't about mere laziness or spiritual fatigue. This is about the tangible resistance in the air, the kind that makes your heart heavy and your spirit weary. It's a war between flesh and spirit, where the enemy's strategy is to cut off our lifeline, communication with God. In these moments, when prayer seems hardest, that's when it's needed most. It's not just a battle of words. It's a fight for your soul's connection to its Creator. Jesus Himself showed us the way when He said that some battles are only won through prayer and fasting. It's in these times of spiritual drought that we must dig our heels in deeper, fasting with a ferocity that matches our fervor in prayer. Imagine this. In the quiet moments of struggle, when you feel most disconnected, that's your cue. 
it's not a signal to retreat, but a call to arms. It's the moment to intensify your spiritual practices, not out of fear, but out of faith. By keeping our spiritual senses sharp, eyes and ears open to the subtle shifts of our spiritual atmosphere, we're not just defending ourselves, we're launching a counterattack. The enemy might whisper despair, dress up discouragement in the guise of overwhelming odds. But remember the Apostle Paul, shipwrecked, stoned, lashed, imprisoned, and beaten, yet not broken. His journey wasn't just one of physical trials, but of spiritual triumphs. His resilience is a testament to the power that lies within us, the power to turn what looks like spiritual defeat into a demonstration of divine strength. Physical ailments, emotional turbulence, and mental battles might seem like random life events, but sometimes they're more. They could be the enemy's tactics to throw us off our spiritual game. But here's our secret weapon, the indomitable power of God within us. By turning to Him, seeking His strength and protection, we're not just surviving attacks, we're building spiritual fortitude. Guard your heart, guard your mind, be vigilant about what you let into your life. Ungodly influences and behaviors aren't just bad choices, they can be open doors for spiritual attacks. But don't let fear be your guide. Instead, let these moments be a catalyst for growth, an opportunity to deepen your trust and faith in God. 5. The Storm of Sudden Life Changes Have you ever felt like, out of nowhere, life just throws a curveball at you? That's what we're diving into today. Picture this. One moment, everything's calm, and then suddenly, it's like a storm hits your life. It's not just any storm, though. It's a tempest that seems to have a purpose, a direction, almost as if it's targeting you. This isn't about bad luck or random chance. It's a clear sign of a spiritual attack, especially for those chosen by God. You see, the battles we face are not just what we see and touch. They're not just about the here and now. Our real struggle is with unseen forces, those rulers and powers in the spiritual realm. It's a battle that's as real as it gets, fought not with physical weapons, but with spiritual armor. Now, when these unexpected changes in life hit us, it's easy to feel overwhelmed. But remember, this is not just a battle. It's a call to arms. It's a wake-up call from God, telling us to rely not on our strength, but on His. In these moments, our faith needs to be like an anchor, keeping us steady amidst the storm. Let's turn to the Bible, our roadmap in these tumultuous times. It's filled with wisdom, guidance, and promises that are like a lighthouse in the dark. And don't forget the power of fellowship. Surround yourself with fellow believers. They are your battalion, your support system, ready to lift you up and encourage you in your walk with Christ. Remember, these sudden life changes might seem like the enemy's doing, but with God on our side, victory is not just a possibility, it's a guarantee. When things seem chaotic, when peace and clarity seem like distant memories, it's another telltale sign of a spiritual onslaught. But here's the good news. We're not defenseless. The enemy might aim to steal, kill, and destroy, but we're armed with something far greater, the power and authority given to us by God Himself. Don't go at it alone. Lean on your fellow believers for prayer and support. Seek that divine peace that only God can give. The Holy Spirit is not just a comforter. It's a guide through the fog of these attacks. Type Amen in the comment if you receive it. Cling to the promises in God's Word. Let the Spirit fill you with clarity and solace. And watch as you overcome every spiritual challenge thrown your way. In a world where the invisible often has the most profound impact, we confront a sinister presence that creeps silently into our sanctuaries, our communities of faith. This is not a story of old, but a present reality we face. The infiltration of an unclean spirit within the walls of our churches, a phenomenon as alarming as it is real. 
Picture this, a force, unseen yet deeply felt, weaving its way through the pews and hearts of the faithful. It's not a tale from a distant past, but a pressing issue we must address today. This spirit, kin to the infamous Jezebel from the Old Testament, represents not just a person, but a symbol of corruption and spiritual decay. Remember Jezebel, the queen who led many astray with her idolatry and murderous schemes against God's prophets. Her legacy is a warning to us, a stark reminder of the devastation that follows when we stray from the path of righteousness. But let's bring this closer to home. How does such a spirit manifest in our times, in our churches? It's subtle yet destructive, sowing seeds of discord, fostering hypocrisy, and diluting the potency of our faith. It's in the whispers of division, in the tolerance of sin under the guise of modernity, and in the gradual shift from biblical truths to feel-good messages that lack depth and transformative power. Why should this concern you, you might ask? Because a church infiltrated by such a spirit is like a ship veering off course, slowly but surely drifting away from its intended destination. It's a community where the light dims, where the salt loses its savor, and where the voice of truth becomes a faint echo in the background. But here's where hope shines brightest, just as Elijah, who once trembled at the thought of Jezebel, found renewed strength from the Lord to confront evil, so too can we stand firm against this infiltration. We are called not to flee in fear, but to face this challenge with courage and faith. Imagine a church awakened, a congregation that recognizes and resists this unclean spirit, a community that returns to its first love, that embraces the purity and power of the gospel, this is not a mere wish, it's a possibility, a potential reality if we dare to confront the uncomfortable truths and seek a revival in our hearts and in our churches. The spirit of Jezebel, this unclean presence, is not an unbeatable foe. It thrives in the shadows of ignorance and complacency. By bringing it into the light, by acknowledging its presence and understanding its tactics, we disarm it of its power. Imagine a church, a place of sanctuary and hope, gradually being overshadowed by the Spirit. It's like a creeping vine, slowly wrapping itself around the very pillars of our faith, trying to choke the life out of it. The Spirit doesn't barge in with a grand entrance, it sneaks in, wearing the mask of familiarity and trust. Now you might wonder, how can we recognize this Jezebel spirit in our midst? It's not always as clear-cut as we hope. The Spirit is a master of disguise, manifesting in attitudes and actions that seem harmless at first. Our primary manifestation is in the guise of manipulation and control, twisting words and actions to serve its purpose. It's like a puppeteer, pulling the strings behind the scenes, causing discord and confusion. Another alarming sign is the erosion of moral and spiritual integrity. This spirit thrives on compromise, slowly nudging believers to bend and twist their values, blurring the lines between right and wrong. It's a slow poison, seeping into the very fabric of our faith community, turning fervor into apathy, conviction into doubt. So, what do we do when we are faced with this challenge? First, we must recognize that this is not a battle of flesh and blood, but of spiritual realms. We arm ourselves not with weapons of anger or judgment, but with the full armor of God. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation. We stand firm, not in our power, but in the strength of the Lord. We also need to foster a culture of accountability and transparency in our churches. It's about creating an environment where honesty and integrity are celebrated, where leaders and members alike are held to the same standard of Christ-like behavior. It's about being vigilant, not paranoid, aware, but not accusatory. And most importantly, we need to pray. Pray for discernment to recognize the workings of the Spirit. Pray for wisdom to address it effectively. Pray for strength to stand firm in our faith. It's a battle, yes, but one that we are equipped to win through the grace and power of our Lord. Remember, the church is not just a building. It's a community of believers, a family. And like any family, we need to protect and nurture each other, especially in the face of adversity. This spirit, this modern-day Jezebel may be among us, but it doesn't have the final say. We as the body of Christ, united in faith and love, have the power to overcome. 
thriving church community, a place where love and faith should reign supreme. Yet, lurking beneath this facade, there's a creeping influence, a distortion of the very essence of what the church stands for. It starts subtly, almost imperceptibly, like a slow poison seeping into the veins of the church body. Consider the spirit of Jezebel, not as a mere historical figure, but as a symbol of something far more insidious. The spirit doesn't just lead individuals astray. It infiltrates the very core of our communities. It's not about the overt idolatry of ancient times, but a modern, more deceptive form. Today, the idolatry manifests to the glorification of individuals, be it pastors, singers, or church leaders, elevating them above the message of Christ. It's a crafty exchange where charisma and talent overshadow true faith. But it's not just about those in the spotlight. This unclean spirit also preys on the congregation, fostering a culture of spiritual prostitution. Picture members of a church, not bound by unity or commitment, but driven by a restless search for personal gratification. They hop from one congregation to another, seeking not spiritual growth, but a leader or community that caters to their whims. When their desires go unmet, they turn to discord, sowing seeds of conflict and undermining the very leadership meant to guide them. This scenario isn't just hypothetical. It's a reality in many of our churches today. The unclean spirit of divisiveness, idolatry, and selfishness is a pervasive threat. But what do we do about it? How do we confront such a covert enemy? The answer lies in returning to the core of our faith, the teachings of Christ. It's about prioritizing God in our hearts above all else. It means cultivating a community that values restoration, patience, and love, especially towards those who have strayed. It's about recognizing the signs of this unclean spirit and addressing them not with condemnation, but with a firm commitment to the truth of the gospel. The church is not just a building or an institution. It's a living, breathing body of believers. Each member plays a crucial role in maintaining its health and integrity. So let's ask ourselves, are we contributing to the strength and unity of our church? Or are we, knowingly or unknowingly, aiding the infiltration of this unclean spirit? This spirit isn't just a myth. It's a living, breathing force, sowing discord and chaos among us. Imagine a spirit so cunning that it could sway a king from his divine path, leading him to worship false idols. Jezebel's legacy isn't just one of manipulation. It's a testament to the power of an unclean spirit to corrupt and destroy. But how does this ancient tale relate to us here and now? Look around. The spirit of Jezebel isn't confined to the pages of history. It walks among us, sometimes in the guise of those we trust. It's in the words of those who seek to control, to dominate, to bend the will of the church to their own desires. These individuals, perhaps unknowingly, act as conduits for this unclean spirit, using their positions of influence not to uplift, but to oppress, not to unify, but to divide. Our church is not a corporate ladder to climb, nor a battlefield for power plays. It's a sanctuary, a place of refuge and love. The Apostle Paul's words in Galatians chapter 5 ring clear. We are called to serve one another in love. But when those who seek authority use it to belittle or control, they don't just go against our teachings. They open the doors for unclean spirits to enter. And what of persecution, the fourth mark of Jezebel's spirit? This is not a relic of the past. It happens here, in our midst, when prophets and truth-tellers are silenced, when those who dare to speak out are ostracized or worse. We witness the spirit of Jezebel at work. It's a strategy as old as time used by the enemy to sow discord and weaken our collective faith. Friends, this isn't about pointing fingers or casting blame. It's a call to vigilance, to discernment. We must guard not only against external threats, but also against this insidious force that can emerge from within. When we encounter individuals who spread division, who speak ill of their brothers and sisters, who persecute our leaders and members, let us remember the words of Jesus. Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. We're urged not to engage in battles of words and wills, but to stand firm in our faith, to intercede, and to exhort when necessary. It's about recognizing the unseen battles that rage around us and choosing to be warriors of peace, unity, and love. 
in our pursuit to defend our faith and our community. Let's not lose sight of the core of our belief, love, compassion, and unity. It's easy to be swept up in the fervor of combating unclean spirits, but our true strength lies in our ability to foster understanding and togetherness. Remember, the spirit of Jezebel thrives on division and discord. By nurturing a culture of empathy and support, we starve these unclean spirits of their power. So, what can we do as individuals in a community to shield our churches from these insidious forces? First, we must be relentless in our pursuit of truth. This means not just listening to the words spoken from the pulpit, but actively seeking understanding through prayer and scripture. It requires us to question, to ponder, and to engage in meaningful dialogue with our brothers and sisters. It's through this relentless pursuit of truth that we can discern the difference between genuine leadership and manipulative control. Second, we must embrace humility. In a world that often equates leadership with power and authority, let's remember that true leadership in the church is about service and sacrifice. It's about putting the needs of others before our own, about guiding rather than controlling. When we approach our roles within the church with humility, we create an environment where the spirit of Jezebel finds no foothold. Third, let's foster a culture of openness and accountability. This means creating spaces where concerns can be voiced without fear of retribution, where leadership is transparent and decisions are made collaboratively. It's in these environments that the light of truth shines brightest, dispelling the shadows where unclean spirits lurk. And finally, let us not forget the power of prayer. It's our most potent weapon against the forces that seek to destabilize and destroy. In prayer, we find strength, guidance, and the discernment to recognize and combat the unclean spirits that threaten our unity. My dear friends, remember that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It's a battle that requires not just vigilance, but a deep and abiding faith in the power of God's love. So, let us stand together, united in our purpose and fortified by our faith. Let's be beacons of light in a world often clouded by darkness. Let's show the world what happens when a church, grounded in love and truth, stands firm against the infiltration of unclean spirits. Together, we can and will make a difference. What if I told you that demons and the devil aren't as scary and powerful as we often think? Nowadays, many people believe that the devil and his demons are unbeatable. So what would you do if you were facing them? Some might say, I don't see demons. They're not real. They're just something people made up to scare us. But that's not true. There's a whole spiritual world out there, and one part of it is filled with demons. In the Bible, Jesus cast out demons from people many times. The Bible shows us signs that the devil and his demons are at work in a person's life. Things like sickness, death, pain, sorrow, and suffering can be their work. Acts 10.38 says that Jesus healed those who were under the devil's power, showing that the devil brings pain and suffering into people's lives. In John 10.10, Jesus says that the devil only comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Why am I telling you all this? It's to let you know that demons have the same mission as the devil, to kill, steal, and destroy. But in this video, I'm going to share a Bible verse that demons don't really want you to know. And I truly believe that you'll feel blessed watching this video. You'll realize by the end of this video how powerful you are as a child of God. As a Christian, you'll see that you're not just ordinary, you're extraordinary. You'll understand that you're not just a regular person, you're supernatural. God has given you so much power to live a victorious life here on earth. Life is a big battle that everyone goes through, but some of us approach this battle from a position of victory. We're not fighting to win, we fight because we've already won, and we want to show our power over demons and the devil. We fight to demonstrate that Satan lost his power and authority when Jesus died on the cross to save us. We fight to display and celebrate the victory that God has over the devil and his demons. Ephesians 6.12 says, We don't fight against flesh and blood, but against powerful forces of evil in the heavenly realms. 
So what's this Bible verse that Satan and his demons don't want you to know? Let me share it with you. It's Luke 10, 19, and it says, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Jesus clearly tells the disciples and all believers that he's given them authority to overcome all the power of the enemy. And who's the enemy? It's the devil and his demons. We have authority over our biggest enemy and challenges. Jesus gave us authority over all Satan's power. Have you ever wondered why, as Christians, we can confidently walk in victory and power over demons? The answer is simple and clear. We've been given authority over the enemy. Notice that it's the singular word enemy and not the plural enemies. The battle for a Christian isn't against many opponents as it's usually thought. Rather, it's a battle against one enemy and that enemy is the devil. In Mark 16, 17 to 18, the Bible once again confirms the authority of believers over the enemy. It says, And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons. They will speak in new languages. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not harm them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. It's interesting to note that the Bible speaks of those who believe, not of those with exceptional faith or greater spirituality than others. Jesus' statement here is simply about those who believe and use the authority of his name. Just like how people drive bicycles, motorcycles, cars, and planes because they have authority over them, the Bible says we can drive out demons, indicating that we have authority over them. It's crucial to remember that our victories over Satan come from the power derived from Jesus Christ. We must confront our spiritual enemy in his name, and Jesus must receive all the praise in whatever victories we achieve, because he has given us the authority to use his name. As believers, we find great joy and satisfaction in our triumph over Satan. If demons are subject to us, what then can stand against us? Since we have great authority over Satan and his demons, we need to know how to take full advantage of this victory. Imagine a soldier on the battlefield who isn't aware that his gun's loaded. He'd be as fearful as a civilian he's supposed to protect. He wouldn't know that the weapon he has is powerful enough to take down his enemies. This is the life of many Christians today. We go through life like any other person, under the fear and torment of demons because we don't realize how powerful the authority God has given us is. We're tossed around by demonic manipulation and various assaults because we fail to use the authority Christ has given to us. Let's take a look at how the Apostle Paul prayed for believers to understand the power that Christ had given them in Ephesians 1, 18 to 21. He prayed, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, in every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. God's power working in us and for us makes the fulfillment of our hopes very certain. It ensures that we'll claim his inheritance. This power is so great that it cannot be compared to any other power in the entire universe. The Apostle Paul illustrates what God's power has done so that we might know what it can do for us. The power that God gives the believer is the most potent and yet most overlooked in the world today. Many Christians don't realize how powerful they are because the authority given to them by Jesus to use his name. We don't know that we can live a life that's full of advantages with this authority. Now, let's explore how believers can fully utilize this God-given power over the enemy and his demons. I'll share two ways that any believer in Christ can fully take advantage of this authority that we now have. It's important to note that I didn't say that we will have this power but that we now have it in Christ, because every believer already possesses this in him. Regardless of your status, you possess this power because you believe. That's it. This isn't because you pray more, fast more, 
give more, or do anything else more. You have this power simply because you dare to believe in the Son of God. The first key to fully embracing your authority and making the devil and his demons tremble is submission. James 4.7 says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Submission is a powerful tool for believers in this life. The more we submit ourselves to the Lord, the easier it becomes to resist the devil. When we resist, the devil has no choice but to run away like the coward he is. One major reason why many people are unable to resist the devil is because they have not fully submitted to the Lord. He will flee. This is a great promise for God's children. Satan is afraid of those who resist him and the strength God gives. But he'll only run from those who submit themselves to God. Submission comes first, then resisting the devil. To resist the devil in your own strength is to invite trouble. We submit to the Lord by praying, dedicating our lives to His kingdom's purposes, and living in accordance with His word every day. Additionally, paying attention to the promptings of the Holy Spirit each day help us to truly submit to God. A believer who submitted to God is one who can resist the devil and his demons, causing them to flee. Submission is very powerful, my friend. The second way to fully utilize your authority over demons is through the power of knowledge. Your knowledge about who you are in Christ is crucial in this battle. Many believers have little or no knowledge about who they are in Christ. They don't even realize that being a Christian places them above all the enemy's operations in the world today. You're not just one among many. You are unique. Let's delve into 2 Corinthians 10, 4-5, which tells us that. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. The battle between truth and falsehood is real. The world, Satan and his demons, aim to destroy the truth of Christ and Christians. On the other hand, God's true servants strive to eradicate falsehood and bring people's thoughts into obedience to Christ. The weapons of Christ's servants differ from the world's weapons. While believers are in the world, we're not meant to employ the world's weapons in our fight for truth. The world's weapons include deceit, charm, force, violence, propaganda, human reasoning, and any method that arises from humanity's fallen nature. As believers, we have our weapons, but they are spiritual. We must rely on God's power working through knowledge, truth, and righteousness. The fullness of God's spirit, honesty, sincerity, and speaking the truth in love are our weapons. These weapons possess divine power. Through them, we can demolish strongholds which are the fortresses of Satan, evil, unbelief, false religion, false philosophy, and arguments against God's truth. To gain more knowledge about our victory, we are called to spend more time with God's Word and to delve deeper with the Spirit's help seeking revelations. God's Word invites us to a rich and compelling fellowship to focus on truth, providing our spirit with the life and light that keeps us strong in this wicked world. There are many distractions that keep you from studying the Bible. As the devil and his demons know that the Bible in the hand of a Christian is like a soldier with a loaded gun. In John 8.32, Jesus says, You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. The Bible is a treasury of truth about God, so delve into the Bible to discover what God has said about you, which will place you ten steps ahead of your adversary. Lastly, Remember that you've been given authority over the power of the enemy by Jesus because you believe. This isn't an exclusive privilege for some believers. It's available to anyone who believes, regardless of age, gender, or nationality. The only requirement is that you must believe. I urge you to make that decision to believe that this power resides within you, lifting you above all adversaries. As you do, it's crucial to consistently submit to God, so that when you confront the devil, he will retreat. Ultimately, 
understand that the devil and demons lack power. They were disarmed by the Lord on the cross. Now, as a child of God, knowing you're more powerful than all the demons in hell and possess the authority to reign over them, begin to stand on that authority and cast out every work of the devil manifesting in your life today. Hallelujah. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. New King James Version tells us, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against power, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. This verse is a stark reminder that our lives are part of a grander, unseen battle. It's not just about what we see and touch, but about what we don't see, the spiritual realm where forces beyond our understanding are at play. Friends, let's talk about something real, something raw, and deeply relevant to our spiritual lives. Have you ever had a dream that lingered, haunting your waking moments? Dreams can be windows, revealing the unseen battles we're part of. They can signal when something's amiss in the spiritual realm particularly pointing towards witchcraft activities, subtly influencing our lives. Let's dive into this with an open heart and a vigilant spirit. Number one, eating in your dreams or dog bites. Ever woke up feeling uneasy after dreaming of feasting on unknown delicacies or startled by a dream where a dog, man's supposed best friend, turns on you with a bite? These aren't just random dream fragments. They're spiritual indicators. Eating in dreams isn't just a nocturnal activity, it's a spiritual transaction. These meals, seemingly innocent, are spiritual concoctions brewed in the cauldrons of darkness, intended to weave unseen covenants with malevolent forces. It's like unknowingly signing a contract in your sleep, binding you to the whims of darkness. What about dog bites? In dreams, dogs are not always the loyal companions we know. Instead, they can be disguises for malevolent spirits, launching covert attacks. A bite in your dream could signify a betrayal or an impending spiritual ailment, often from sources closer than you think. Remember, Jesus himself warned in Matthew chapter 10, verse 36, that a man's enemies will be those of his own household. It's a wake-up call to be spiritually vigilant, even in familiar territories. In both cases, these dreams are a call to action. It's a signal to armor up spiritually, to engage in fasting and prayer. These practices aren't just religious rituals. They are your spiritual warfare tools to break these unseen bonds and cleanse your spirit. When you rise in the morning after such dreams, let your first meal be that of spiritual fortitude, prayer, fasting, and the Word of God. Just as David faced Goliath not with physical strength, but with faith in a sling, face these spiritual challenges with the weapons God has provided us. Remember, these dreams are not to scare us, but to prepare us. They remind us that our lives are battlegrounds where unseen forces vie for influence. But take heart, for Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 doesn't end with a warning. It's a call the spiritual arms. We're reminded that our real fight isn't against what we can see, but against these spiritual forces. So, let's stand firm, armored with faith, and vigilant in prayer. For in Christ, we have victory over every hidden snare of the enemy. Number 2. Night after night, you find yourself walking through a shadowy realm where the faces of the departed, those whom you once held dear, appear to you. But here's the catch. These aren't the loving spirits of your ancestors. They are, instead, cunning disguises employed by familiar spirits. These deceptive entities are not here to comfort, but to ensnare, perpetrating generational curses that have clung to your family like a persistent shadow. These dreams, where the deceased seem to reach out from beyond, are not just mere figments of your imagination. They are spiritual battlefields. These familiar spirits, masquerading as your departed loved ones, are there to form covert covenants, leading you unknowingly down paths that mirror the struggles and failures of those gone before you. The Bible, or guiding light, clearly states that God is the God of the living, not the dead. The memories of our beloved may remain etched in our hearts, but the Lord warns us against seeking counsel or communication with the dead. So. When the night brings images of those who have passed, remember, 
It's a sly trick of the enemy, a wolf in sheep's clothing. But it's not just this appearance of the deceased that holds significance in your dreamscapes. Have you ever found yourself in a dream, besieged, beaten, and battered, perhaps by faces unknown or unseen? This isn't just a random nightmare. It's a glaring sign, a spiritual SOS. Your spirit, the very essence of your being, is under siege. Forces unseen, emissaries of darkness are launching covert attacks. It's a spiritual ambush, a warning of betrayal or hidden animosity, a revelation that not all is as it seems in the waking world. In these moments of revelation, what do we do? Do we surrender to fear, to despair? Absolutely not. This is where our faith, our belief in a power greater than any darkness comes into play. It's a call to arms, a reminder to don the full armor of God to stand firm against these spiritual onslaughts. Prayer becomes our fortress, our stronghold in these turbulent times. When dreams hint at the looming shadow of the spirit of death or the betrayal of unseen forces, it's a clarion call to seek divine intervention. It's in these times of trial that we must fervently seek the face of God, asking for deliverance, for protection, for the breaking of chains that generations past have unwittingly forged. Remember, dear listener, in the realms of dreams, not everything is as it seems. Number three, have you ever found yourself in a dream where you're locked away, trapped in a prison or a cage? It might feel like you're screaming for help, but no sound escapes. This isn't just a nightmare, it's a signal. A red flag waving in the spiritual wind. It symbolizes that there are unseen chains binding you, holding you back from your true potential. Think about it. You have the skills, the heart, the drive, but something inexplicable keeps pulling you back. It's as if an invisible hand is pressing down, keeping you from soaring. These dreams, my friends, are wake-up calls. They're God's way of showing you that there are spiritual strongholds in your life, barriers that you need to break through with fervent prayer and faith. And then there are those other dreams, the ones that leave you waking up feeling dirty and confused, talking about dreams of a sexual nature. Now, I know this is a delicate subject, but it's crucial we talk about it. These dreams aren't just figments of your imagination or random firings of a sleepy brain. No, these are spiritual encounters of a dark kind. The faces you see, the situations you find yourself in, they aren't just dreams, they're spiritual attacks. These encounters are the enemy's ploys, his way of planting seeds of lust and perversion, of binding you with chains of sin and shame. It might be hard to believe, but these dreams are no less than spiritual warfare. The demonic forces use these visions as a way to forge evil covenants, agreements that they hold against you. These covenants have real consequences in your waking life. They might manifest as struggles in your relationships, hindrance in your path to marriage, or even barriers in your financial prosperity. It's like walking through life with a heavy chain dragged behind you, unseen but ever-present. But here's the hope, the light in the darkness. These chains can be broken. You have a powerful ally in this spiritual warfare, God. When these dreams come, don't dismiss them as mere figments of your imagination. Recognize them for what they are, alarms calling you to spiritual action. Turn to prayer, seek God's face, ask for deliverance. He is waiting to set you free to break those chains and to lead you out of that spiritual prison. Remember, in this journey of life, you're not alone. God is with you, his angels are fighting for you, and his strength is made perfect in your weakness. So let's stand together, pray together, and break these spiritual strongholds. Number four, friends, have you ever found yourself in a dream, standing amidst a somber burial scene or seeing everyday objects like your keys or wallet buried in a mysterious place. These are not just random images. They could be spiritual red flags, signaling something far more serious. Let's take a moment to understand this. Imagine you're at a burial, a place where we confront the reality of mortality. Now, picture in your dream, rats and roaches scurrying around. These aren't just pests. In the spiritual realm, they symbolize forces working against you the spirit of destruction and household wickedness. 
It's like having an unseen enemy silently working to undo your life's work, targeting your prosperity, your career, and your well-being. But there's more. Ever dreamt of losing your hair or seeing it being cut off? In many cultures, hair represents strength and glory. Losing it in a dream might feel unsettling, but it's more than that. It's a spiritual alert, a warning that your personal glory, your God-given potential is under attack. Now you might ask, why is this happening to me? Remember, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 22, Jesus said, Follow me and let the dead bury their dead. This is a powerful reminder that even while we are physically alive, we can be spiritually asleep or dead. These dreams are wake-up calls, urging us to shake off spiritual lethargy and take up our spiritual armor. You see, the enemy, the devil, doesn't play fair. He's cunning and relentless, but here's the truth. He's also defeated. Yes, these dreams might seem like a plot straight out of a horror movie. But remember, we are the protagonists of this story, armed with faith and the power of prayer. The Bible tells us God has not given us the spirit of fear. So, while these dreams might be alarming, they are not meant to scare us into submission, but to stir us into action. The key here is not to ignore these signs. If left unaddressed, these spiritual attacks can manifest in our waking lives, affecting our work, our relationships, and our peace. But there's hope, a shining light in this darkness, the power of prayer and the authority we have in Jesus Christ. So, what do we do when faced with such dreams? We stand firm, we pray, we declare victory over every plan of the enemy. Remember, our battles are not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces. And in this battle, we are not helpless. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Dreams of burials, pests, or losing our hair might be unsettling, but they're not the end of the story. They are calls to spiritual arms. Let these dreams not be a source of fear, but a catalyst for faith. Let them remind us to stay vigilant, to pray without ceasing, and to hold fast to the promises of God. For in Him, we have victory, hope, and a peace that surpasses all understanding. Number five, have you ever found yourself in a dream, heart pounding, as you're running from an unseen terror or a ferocious beast? Or perhaps you've woken up with the unsettling image of blood, an alarm bell in the night. These aren't just figments of your imagination. They could be signals, spiritual alerts, if you will. Firstly, consider the profound biblical truth that life is inherently connected to blood. When you see blood in your dreams, particularly your own, it's more than a mere nightmare. It could be a divine signal, a warning bell, alerting you to an unseen battle waging against your spirit. Think about it. A pregnant woman dreaming of losing blood. This isn't just a random fear. It's a spiritual SOS, call to arms for prayer and vigilance. But here's the twist. These dreams, as alarming as they are, aren't meant to paralyze us with fear. Oh no, they are in fact God's way of handing us the battle plans of the enemy. It's like being given a secret map to navigate and thwart the adversary's schemes. So, when you wake up from a dream, don't let fear rule you. Instead, let it drive you to your knees in fervent prayer. Now, Let's talk about those chase dreams. Ever found yourself sprinting in your dream, pursued by something terrifying? It's like you're in a thriller, but you're the lead actor, and the stakes are your soul. This isn't just a run-of-the-mill nightmare. It's a telltale sign of spiritual warfare, a clear indicator of witchcraft acting against you. These dreams are different. They're not random. They're targeted attacks, and they require a strategic spiritual response. But here's the key. It's not only about what happens in the dream. It's also about how you feel when you wake up. Do you carry that fear into your day, feeling a shadow lurking behind you? That's a significant sign, my friends. It's as if the dream is leaping out of your sleep and into your reality. That's when you know it's more than just a dream. It's a spiritual alert. So, what do you do when you're faced with these harrowing night visions? You turn to the ultimate source of power and protection, God Almighty. You see, these dreams, they're not just warnings, they're also invitations. Invitations to engage in deeper, more fervent prayer, to put on the full armor of God and stand firm against the wiles of the enemy. 
Let's not shy away from these spiritual battles. Instead, let's face them with the courage and strength that comes from faith. Remember, in Christ, we are not victims of the night. We are victors in the light. These dreams, as ominous as they may seem, are opportunities for us to engage in spiritual warfare, to draw closer to God, to experience His delivering power in our lives. So, my dear friends, let's embrace this journey with hope and conviction. Let's see these dreams not as sources of fear, but as calls to spiritual action. Together, let's pray, stand firm, and witness the mighty hand of God moving in our lives, turning our nightmares into testimonies of His grace and power. Remember, in Christ, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Stay blessed, stay vigilant, and keep the faith. And if you have liked it so far, please drop a like and subscribe. You're not just a bystander in this cosmic conflict. You're a warrior armed with truth. The air crackles with tension, a testament to the unseen battle waged around us daily. Demons, those ancient foes, weave illusions and deceit, but you hold the key to their undoing. This isn't about reciting empty words. It's about embracing a living truth. The scripture isn't just ink on paper. It's a breath of divine power, a surge of heavenly might. When you utter these sacred words, you're not just speaking. You're declaring war against the shadows. Many believe demons are invincible, lurking in every corner, waiting to pounce. But here's the twist. They're not the all-powerful beings some fear them to be. Their true weapon? Our ignorance. They thrive in the silence of unspoken truths and the shadows of unchallenged lies. It's more than just a sequence of words. It's a testament to the ultimate victory already claimed. Consider the verse in James 4, 7, a beacon of truth and strength. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Simple yet profound, it's a declaration of allegiance to the Almighty and rebellion against the darkness. This is not about instilling fear, but igniting courage. It's about understanding that while the spiritual realm is real, so is the victory promised to us. Each word you speak from the Bible is a light piercing through the darkness, a reminder to the forces of evil that their end is already written. But why don't we hear more about this? Why is this potent truth not on every believer's lips? The answer is as old as time itself, fear and complacency. But you, brave soul, can change that narrative. By bringing this knowledge into the light, you're not just defending yourself, you're reclaiming ground long surrendered. Envision the impact. Each word you speak doesn't just echo in the physical realm, but resounds through the spiritual, sending tremors of fear through the enemy's ranks. Your voice becomes a rallying cry, a beacon for others lost in the fog of fear and doubt. This isn't a dreary sermon or a gloomy warning. It's an adventure invitation. It's a call to explore the depths of divine power and to witness firsthand the crumbling of the enemy's fortresses. It's a journey from fear to freedom, from ignorance to enlightenment. As you stand firm, clad in the armor of God's word, remember this, you are not alone. You're part of an unbroken line of warriors each echoing the same triumphant truth through the ages. The demons fear this knowledge, for it spells their undoing. So, take up this mantle with a light heart and a firm resolve. Dive into the scriptures with a spirit of discovery and defiance. Seek out the verses that resonate with your soul, that empower and embolden you to stand your ground. Make it your mission to uncover these hidden gems, to share them, to live them. This is more than just about knowing a verse. It's about embodying a truth. It's about transforming your life into a testament to the power that lies within God's Word. So, step forward, speak out, and watch as the shadows flee before the light you carry within you. This is your moment, your calling, your battle cry. 
Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. It's a two-step dance with the divine that puts the enemy on the run. Imagine a bully, all bluster and menace, until you stand up, backed by the ultimate authority. That's what happens when you align with heaven's rhythm. Submission isn't about weakness. It's about aligning with the source of all strength. It's the choice to walk humbly under God's mighty hand, where favor flows like a river. It's understanding that our very breath, our heartbeat, is a gift from the one who crafted the universe. Every night's rest, every new dawn, is a testament to his sustaining power. In our surrender, we find the might to stand firm. Now, let's flip the script. Resisting the devil isn't a passive wish. It's an active battle cry. It's recognizing the sneaky ways he tries to slip into our thoughts and decisions, aiming to keep us from our divine destiny. But here's the kicker. When we're fully dialed into God's frequency, the devil's deceit dissolves. He's got no hold, no claim, no power. Like a shadow dispelled by the light, he has to flee. This isn't a fairy tale. It's the raw reality of spiritual warfare. The enemy wants you ignorant, isolated, and intimidated. But knowledge is power, and this power is yours. It's the revelation that when you're under God's authority, you're over the enemy's antics. You're not just surviving, you're thriving. An overcomer by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. So, what's the game plan? It's simple, yet profound. Step one, fall into the arms of grace. Recognize your need for the Creator, the one who knows your end from the beginning. Step two, stand up to the adversary with the authority of heaven backing you. This isn't about shouting matches with the unseen. It's about the quiet confidence that comes from knowing who you are and whose you are. In this journey, remember, the battlefield is often the mind. Guard it fiercely with truth, with love, with the word that's a lamp to your feet. Let every thought be taken captive and made obedient to Christ. Your words have power, your faith has substance, and your God has an undefeated record. In the grand tapestry of eternity, each thread, each of you, is vital. You're not a spectator. You're a participant in the greatest story ever told. The victory is already won, but the daily battles still need your courage, faith, your yes to God. So, as you step into the fray, remember the verse that echoes through the ages, a beacon of hope and a declaration of victory. James 4.7 isn't just a verse, it's your battle cry. It's the reminder that in God's kingdom, the underdog reigns supreme. And the ultimate underdog, the one who conquered sin and death, is fighting for you. Let this be your anthem, your rallying cry. As you submit to God and resist the devil, watch as the enemy scatters, as freedom sings, and as you walk in the abundant life destined for you. Let's take a moment to reflect on the seven sons of Sceva from Acts 19. They thought they could mimic the power of Paul without understanding that his strength came from a life surrendered to God. Their failure was a stark reminder that authority over demons isn't about knowing the right words. It's about living the right life. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Matthew 16, 19 isn't just a verse. It's a divine mandate a celestial decree that, when uttered with faith, sets the heavens in motion and puts demons on the run. While some souls drifted into eternity last night, you were given another day, another chance to make your life a testament to God's power. The enemy's greatest deception was convincing Eve that she didn't need to adhere to God's command. He fears your obedience because it's the weapon that renders him powerless. Your submission to God isn't just an act of devotion. It's an act of war against the forces that seek your downfall. Imagine you're holding a sword, not just any sword, but one forged in divine fire, 
etched with words of life and hope. This isn't a tale of ancient warriors. It's about you, armed with a verse that demons dread. Ephesians 6.11 doesn't just suggest, it commands, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now, why would such a call to arms be so vital? Think of the countless whispers of discouragement and fear that cloud our minds daily. These aren't just random thoughts. They're calculated attacks from an unseen enemy. But here's where our plot twists. We're not defenseless. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. These aren't mere metaphors. They're our arsenal, our defense, and our offense in a battle for our very souls. John 3, 16 and 17 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. Pause and let that sink in. The Creator of the universe didn't send His Son into the world to point fingers or unleash wrath. He sent Him to rescue, to save, to offer a bridge back to hope and life. Now, imagine the devil's dismay when a single soul grasps this truth. It's like a blazing torch in the darkest dungeon. The enemy's greatest weapon is deceit, convincing us that we're unworthy of love or beyond grace. But the moment we realize that Jesus came not to condemn but to bring life, the chains of guilt and fear start breaking. And what about those moments when we stumble and fall? There's a voice that accuses, that drags us through the mud of our mistakes. That's not the voice of the Holy Spirit. He convicts, yes, but leads us to repentance and peace, not to despair and hopelessness. Recognizing this difference is crucial. The enemy wants you shackled in guilt, but God offers armor and a way back to freedom. Ephesians 4.27 offers a straightforward yet profound command. Give no opportunity to the devil. Simple, right? Yet within these few lines lies a strategy, a call to vigilance and self-control. It's a reminder that even the smallest crack, the tiniest foothold, can be an open invitation for darkness to enter. But the story doesn't end there. Romans 13, 14 provides the blueprint for victory. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. It's a call to arms to clothe ourselves with the character and love of Jesus, leaving no room for the flesh to lead us astray. As you navigate the challenges and the battles of this life, remember this hidden verse and the powerful truth it holds. Guard your heart fortify your spirit, and stand firm in the knowledge that you are loved, redeemed, and more than a conqueror through Him who loves you. Let this message resonate, not just as a distant concept, but as a living, breathing reality in your life. Embrace it, live it, and share it. For in doing so, you shine a light that not only illuminates your path, but also breaks through the darkness that surrounds you. You see, the enemy tries to trap you in a cycle of guilt and shame, making you believe that you're defined by your missteps, that your worth is measured by a checklist of do's and don'ts. But that's where he's wrong. Our worth, our identity, is rooted in something far greater than our actions. It's anchored in the unchanging love of God. So, how do we combat this prowling lion? 1 Peter 5.8 doesn't just depict the problem, it offers a solution. Be sober-minded, be watchful. It's a call to arms, a rallying cry for vigilance. This doesn't mean living in fear, oh no. It means living in awareness and armed with the truth and grounded in faith. Imagine yourself as a watchman on the walls eyes wide open, heart steadfast because you know the truth. The devil might be cunning, but he's no match for a heart fortified by the word of God. He preys on the weak, 
but what he finds in you is a spirit strengthened by grace and truth. And here's where we turn the tables. Instead of cowering in fear, let's step out in faith. Let's be a community that supports each other, sharing our struggles and lifting each other up. Let's remind one another of the truth that sets us free. And when the night feels too dark, when the whispers grow too loud, let's hold fast to that verse, 1 John 1, 9, and proclaim it boldly. Let's live out that truth, showing the world that we're not defined by our past, but by the glorious future God has for us. As we wrap up this journey, I invite you to join me in a movement of hope and freedom. Let's be the light that scatters the shadows, the voice that speaks truth in the midst of lies. And if this message resonated with you, if you felt that spark of hope, then don't keep it to yourself. Like, subscribe, and share this with someone who needs to hear it.